emergency rooms can then, usually it's the, the head nurse or the QMHP, whoever's on duty that kind of does the assessment and realizes, hey, this person is struggling with some mental health concerns or some substance abuse concerns, let's get them to a place where they can get connected. So they're going to make a referral. Um, the EMS and police and fire department do not have to call or or make a referral first. They can bring people to the front door. Currently, and I'm not sure how much longer we'll be doing this, but we are currently um, doing COVID swabs and testing people at the door. So if somebody does come, they will have to pass that initial COVID test to get in the door. Um, again, as those things are lifting up, we might be making that change. But we started that process back in the fall so we could open back up to walk-ins because we had to close down for walk-ins during the initial um, breakout of the pandemic. Um, so that's kind of where we get all of our referrals. So these emergency services are out there, they're seeing these people and they know, hey, they need something else. So let's get them to the place where they can go. And that's why that we have to um, have this conversation with different agencies before we allow the ability to, to do intakes for them because the hospitals actually pay the city and the city pays us. Now, Rediscover starts every year with a $600,000 deficit and that means that we take care of the rest of that that cost. And we do that through grants and other and other sort of things to kind of um, to just facilitate this because we know that it works. So what happens when somebody comes into KCATC? Again, they're going to come to the front door. They'll have that initial screening if they have and if they come from the hospital, they have to have the COVID test before we approve them coming. Once they get in the door, they're met with one of our council techs and the security guard. They're just going to wand them, make sure they don't have any um, weapons, drugs, anything illegal that we have to dispose of. If they do come to us, if they have anything, you know, weapons of any kind, things like that, we don't have the ability to take them from them. All we do is put them in a safe. I feel like that's an important thing for people to know. If they come in with a gun and it's their gun, we do not have a legal right to take that gun from them. It just goes into a safe and then when they leave, we give it back to them. Um, obviously, if there's street drugs, we have to, to um, get rid of those. If there's unopened alcohol, that's kind of the call of whoever's taking them in. Um, so it's just kind of you know going through the property, making sure everything's safe and everything's locked away. After that point, the CIT uh, or the CT is going to talk with them and see, do you need food? Do you need a shower? What can we do to make you comfortable right here, right now? Because they might have to wait a few minutes to get in to see the team lead to get evaluation or it might take a little bit longer if we're kind of running busy but we want to make them as comfortable and kind of hopefully keep them from doing any escalation because a lot of times before they've come to us there's been a lot of escalation on site so we're going to try to, to monitor that and make them feel very comfortable um, from that process then they're going to meet with our team lead at this point, it's been about six months that most of our team leads and our nursing staff work together because there's a list of questions. And unfortunately, the nurse has to ask some of the same questions and needs some of that same knowledge that the team lead knows. And if they are somebody who's already encountered the police or the EMS or anybody else, in the meantime, they're already frustrated and don't want to answer these questions anymore. So our team lead and nurse will try the best they can to do that together that way we are only asking one time we're limiting their frustrations and their ability to again escalate again um, so but we go through the the uh, team lead what they're looking for so they're going to be your qualified mental health provider who's looking to find out can we do we see any mental health symptoms is there some history of mental health they have access to different systems where we can look up see if they have connections in the community do they have case management services somewhere and they're just not showing up how do we get them back to that so that team leads going to look for those initial mental health type situations in history and then the nursing um, they're going to have particular things that they're going to talk about and this is our nursing manager carrie and so she can talk a little bit about what the qualifiers are to get in and to get out so things that you if you see these don't bother because you have to go to the hospital first. Otherwise, yeah, bring them on in. What we're looking for is to make sure that they can somewhat participate in an assessment and aren't impaired to the point where they can't walk. If, if you guys see that they can't even walk um, because they're so intoxicated or impaired, that's something that's going to require um, them being screened and sent to the emergency department first. Um, our um, nursing assessment is real basic, um, quick head to toe review of systems, um, making sure that um, their blood pressure isn't super sky high, 
um, dealing with the population that we do, um, people that are under the influence or people that are homeless, they're not necessarily the most medication compliant. Um, so we know that their blood pressure is going to be elevated. Um, and blood sugars, we have a lot of people that come in with uncontrolled blood sugars. Well, we're just making sure that there isn't anything critical going on at that very moment that doesn't warrant a trip to the ED. Um, because they are going to be with us for such a short amount of time, which Wendy will get to shortly, uh, we know that we're not going to be able to get a lot of medical conditions under control. But we are just wanting to make sure that they are medically stable to continue um, and participate in their treatment. So KCATC, what we are, like I said, we are open 24-7 every single day of the week. We have no holidays, and actually holidays are the slow days at KCATC, in case you were wondering. Um, full moons, no, those are not the, the low days. Um, again, we accept the, our referrals from EDs, EMS, KC, PD. Well, we have um, additional fire departments. We keep broadening out and we want to keep partnering. So anytime we get new one things that, that aren't on here, we now also work with, we have, there's a new thing called a co-responder that now work with police departments. The Independence has one, Kansas City has them, Lee Summit has them. Um, so that's kind of a new thing that they're implementing into just the services provided to the community is kind of get that mental health person on scene with some of these things so we can be making a better decision at the start for them. Um, again, we do do walk-ins. Right now our walk-ins are just the eight to three. I, we stopped that, the walk-ins at the beginning of COVID, and then we realized when we put this kind of time constraint on it, it works a lot better. It works a lot better with the community too. Um, it keeps my staff a lot safer as well because we will sometimes get somebody that walks up to the door at two in the morning. This isn't to say that if that person walks up and that you, you we see that they are absolutely in need, we are not going to turn somebody away. We're just not open for referrals. So that person gets to make that um, call, but at night on our overnight, we have a nurse, we have a team lead, and we have a security guard, and then hopefully five techs, but they're on the unit. So you really only have three people out front. So for safety purposes, we try to cut off that walk-in um, process at three o'clock in the afternoon. So we do have an availability to have up to 18 clients. We have two different units. We label them so being in mental health that it really doesn't mean anything. If the opportunity gets it that we can have per persons that we know that we've identified that they're going to maybe need extra care because they might have slip into detox, things like that, it's better to have them all together if we can. Um, but again, as people come in, we're going to put people in the units. The units each have nine beds on either side. One isolation bed is included in that, and so that's for your persons. Maybe somebody's at more acute or just went through a, a specific trauma, can't be around people, or maybe they're just loud and really high right now, and they came in at three in the morning, and you don't want everybody else awake. So we have that opportunity to put them in that isolation. One thing we cannot do, though, um, it is also, it is completely voluntary. So if you bring anybody in, I don't care if the police bring them in, no matter who brings somebody to our door, the second they get dropped off, they can choose not to stay with us. So at any point during their stay, and again, it happens at two in the morning and we hate that, but if they choose they want to leave, we have to let them leave. Um, so we will. So it's not, we're not locked. We also are not able, this is one of those tricky ones. It's tricky, I say, because I work in mental health. I've worked in it for a very long time. The suicide ideality, that is really kind of one of those toughy situations. If somebody is actively telling you, yes, I'm going to kill myself no matter what you do, I'm going to kill myself, I will have a way. That person cannot come to KCATC. We do not have the ability to offer one-on-one -on -one observation, and that's what somebody who is actively suicidal requires. So they have to have that one person literally staring at them the whole time they're there. Um, we're not that way. It's an open unit. If I could, I sh maybe should have brought a picture so you kind of see it, but it's just an open unit and the things that we call beds, they're actually the chairs that the dads sit in while moms are giving birth. <laughs> so they fold down and they do fully recline, um, but they're just partitioned between. So it is a big room, right? And so we don't have that ability to just kind of section it off and give that person what they need, nor do we have the staff, nor were we created for such a thing. So if there is a suicidal concern and they are saying they are active, and yes, it is, they need to go to the hospital. You can take them to the hospital and leave them with the suggestion to make a referral to KCATC once they've been cleared from that suicidal concern. So that's one thing that does have to be. Everybody kind of gets a little they're like, well, they said it, but I don't think you really meant it. If they said it, you have to verify if they meant it, right? 
Um, if it's the guy that's like, now if you let me out of here, I'm just going to go walk over the bridge and jump. And you know that the bridge is like two foot high, then he's probably really not suicidal. You know, so that's kind of where it gets a little tricky. And we're always happy to field phone calls if you ever have a concern about somebody too. So just so you know, if you're, if you're kind of stuck on that suicide question, you can go ahead and call us. Um, we don't do therapy there. We are not a housing provider. We're not a shelter. And we do not have detox. A lot of the community gets very confused on the difference between sobering and detox. We do not have the ability to medically stable anybody that is going through physical detox. So we're not good for that. Um, again, Heartland's about one of the only detoxes around here and we do work very closely with them. So oftentimes some, what somebody's reached that threshold and they've passed the concern, then they'll refer them back over to us to get them reconnected into the community. So. Um, that's kind of my first little rundown. Any questions popping in anybody's heads right now? Yes. You can let them know. Yes, I do know what you mean because we get that a lot. You can let them know that we we do not have an obligation and we actually have an obligation to the client, not to the police. So if somebody comes in with warrants, I don't care what the warrants are for, I do not have the responsibility to call the police and tell them that this person is there. End of story. So however you feel is best that they'll they'll understand that when you communicate that, you can tell them. We are just like, um, well, I was gonna say some shelters, but domestic violence shelters do check first to see if you have any warrants before they take you. But we don't have that, we don't have that obligation. We are, our obligation is to the person that we're serving, and so we have to do what's best for them. And so calling the police on somebody isn't really what's best. That's why I say again, even if they have weapons, we're not gonna take them from you. They'll be given to you as you're walking out the front door when you leave. So we're not here to restrict anybody from anything. Our hope is that we're going to help get you guys connected to something. And what you can tell them is another thing that we have. So once they've been on the unit, right? So they've seen the nurse and we put them on the unit. We try to, um, our goal is to have everybody out within 23 hours, right? So like I said, they come in. Um, I forgot she's here. We have the medical team, we've got our team leads, we've got our council techs, and then we have the outside of this, right? So we have case managers and discharge planners. The discharge planners basically do a second mini eval with the client because when you are hungry, you haven't slept for seven days, and you are high as Cooter Brown, you're going to want something completely different than you are 20 hours later after I've slept, showered, and have clean clothes on, right? So they're going to reevaluate them and say, okay, what is your crisis now? Where are you at? What can we help you with now? Um, and so they're going to work with them that way. If they say, if they identify there's housing, we might be able to offer them two weeks of housing. So we'll, we'll put them somewhere. We'll pay for it for two weeks. Um, we do our best to assess people in the situation. So if, if you don't have a job and you need some place to stay, we're most likely going to refer you over to restart because at the end of that time, you can possibly switch over to shelter life and you won't be required to pay. But if you have SSI and we know you're getting so much, then we're more likely to recommend you to go to a transitional house where you can continue to pay after that first two weeks is taken care of. So it's just everybody is so that the plan for that we do is absolutely specific to the person as they are there. Um, and they all have the opportunity to take case management. So the person can decline or accept case management services, discharge services and the uh, medications. So if they want connection to medications, our APRN will come in, they'll see them, we will give them medications and they get a 30 day supply when they're walking out the door because we know those bridge appointments are taking longer than the 30 days out in the community. So we want to do our best to be a partner and not have people having to come back. Um, the other part that we do is the Suboxone and so that I've never taking the time to know too much about because there's too much to know. So again, I'm gonna let Carrie talk about Suboxone and how we go about doing Suboxone inductions or how we know if somebody should come to our facility to get Suboxone. So we know that there's a huge opiate crisis um, metro-wide. Um, people looking to get off opiates. Um, for the longest time it was just methadone, but now we have Suboxone. Suboxone can only be initiated um, by someone that is licensed and, and has the clearance to do so. Um, our um, medical director um, is uh, one of those physicians. 
And we also have some of our nurse practitioners as well that have clearance to initiate. It's real tricky now uh, because everything that people are getting off the street, almost everything has fentanyl in it. That seems to be delaying um, your peak withdrawal when we would be initiating uh, the suboxone induction. And that's one thing that the nurses um, are, are um, real attentive to, because if we start somebody on suboxone too soon, um, we're going to be precipitating withdrawal. They're going to hate us and they're going to feel even more miserable. So if you see somebody, you know, you're thinking about bringing them in and you know, they last used an hour ago and don't have any withdrawal symptoms, they're going to be hanging out with us for a while. We're just going to be looking and waiting, which is fine. Um, absolutely fine. We need to see them. We need to assess them. Um, but we do the cows scoring their clinical opiate withdrawal scale. Um, and for us to initiate um, doing a suboxone induction, which takes um, eight, nine hours, because um, we, we titrate the dose up, um, it, they have to be scoring at a 13. Um, so what I usually tell them is on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most miserable that you're feeling, we need you at an eight or a nine before we can initiate it because I'm not going to do you any favors if you know, you, you've got a little bit of nausea and you know a little bit of joint pain. If I start it now, uh, you're going to be absolutely miserable. So there is a process to it. Um, but we can start the suboxone and do the inductions. Um, our doctor, our, our psychiatrist is there Monday through Friday. Um, usually from eight to five. And so even if they're not in active withdrawal at the time that they come in, uh, he could see them and say, okay, uh, once they get to a 13, let's go ahead and, and start the induction. Um, so as long as they're there when, it's, when one of the providers that is licensed to um, uh, initiate the suboxone, as long as they're seen. Another thing that we could do if they come in in the evening time, our urgent care um, center, which is over in Raytown, they um, are staffed with uh, nurse practitioners. Several of them um, are able to initiate suboxone. If somebody comes in in the evening time and one of those um, uh, nurse practitioners is over at urgent care, we could do a tele um, visit so that way they can be seen and go ahead and give nursing the order. Okay, you know, two o'clock in the morning rolls around and you know they reach that that magical cow score, we can go ahead and start it. The problem that we're running into is we don't have anybody on the weekends. Um, and so sometimes what we end up doing is uh, having to send clients out to the emergency room if if we don't have a provider there that can see them um, and they're really, really struggling. We have comfort meds that we can give, um, but without having a licensed clinician um, that can give us the OK to start that suboxone. Um, but we're almost always OK, Monday through Friday. Um, yeah, we've got our doc in house from eight to five. Um, and then we can usually get a nurse practitioner right. to do tele um, from the hours of 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And we can send them out too with a, because uh, that's another thing that Wendy had kind of touched upon with medications. Uh, we can send them out once we get them on their maintenance dose, send them out with a week's supply of the suboxone strips. So that way, um, while they're waiting to get in with a provider, um, they have a, a supply to get them through. And one thing we are not able to do, we cannot do follow up appointments because we are a crisis center, so we can't do follow up. The exception to that would be if the APRN, the provider thinks that somebody needs to be come back to be checked because of a medication. Oftentimes they'll keep somebody longer than the 23 hours that we have stay around and we never argue with our APRN. <laughs> if they say they stay, we say yes. Um, so sometimes they might stay a little longer. And then the only other exception to that, obviously, is if we're wanting to put someone on an injectable, oftentimes they have to start with a pill. And so the doctor would follow up with that process or they might take a smaller dose of the injectable and require a follow up within one week. So they would do that. So it's just that's the getting onboarding them onto a drug. But other than that, they can't do the refills of those drugs. We are able to initiate um, at KCKTC the, the newer medications, the long acting injectables, the antipsychotics that alleviate the need for clients to take a pill every single day, which for our population is wonderful. We can get them to commit to getting, you know, a, a 30 day injectable you know, once a month and they've got their antipsychotic on board. They don't have to remember to take it every day. Um, it, it's 
just been miraculous in the field of psych medication with um, the invention of these medications. Yeah, especially when approximately 90% of our population are homeless. Uh, about 80% of them have co-occurring disorder and I honestly feel like 100% of all people have medical have mental illness. <laughs> so there's that at one point or another. Um, so how do you get somebody in? So again, we just we want to identify that there's a crisis. What's the need? Why do you think they need to come to us? What can we do that's going to make things different for them? If you think about us as a connector in the community, it'll kind of help muddle out some of those questions when you're with somebody, right? So what we're looking for are those people that they might have an open episode of care. At, comprehensive, but they've not gone to see their provider or connected with their case manager once, right? So this is somebody who's unmedicated, needs to get back on medications. That'd be a great person for us. Someone who the, their homelessness is not a criteria for a crisis. Is the homelessness part of the crisis in front of you? So that's one of those hard things because sometimes we get community people who've been doing this for years who just want to send us somebody because they're looking for some place to sleep. But this person's been homeless for 20 years and one more night doesn't change. That's not the problem, right? So we want to find out. But if you have somebody, they just got in a fight or they got kicked out or they're on their fifth night of sleeping on the street. I mean, that person's perfect because they don't even know what resources are out there. So they need to get somewhere that can connect them. And one thing we talk about often is our location is 12th and Prospect. So a lot of people get a little hesitant and don't want to come to that location for services. One thing that would be helpful is you can let them know that we are a rediscover. And so our actual facility and where we treat is South Kansas City. Sometimes that'll make people a little more com comfortable because the fact that somebody, if they are homeless, then it doesn't matter their catchment area. They get services wherever they are. So that is one thing that sometimes stops people from wanting to come where we are. So if you can let them know that's just where we're housed, but that doesn't mean those are where the resources are that we're going to send them out. So um, if you get kind of some pushback, they're like, well, maybe I do. And then you tell them where it's at and they're like, that sometimes will kind of be helpful to, to ease that over. Um, people that just need connection to housing services, emergency services, again, a lot of people just don't know what resources are out there. They, they've never been in these situations before. And then a lot of times people don't understand that the the drug use can be a crisis all on its own. And I mean, if that's something that they're stuck in, they don't know, they've never looked for help. And the reason that they're stuck there is because again, they don't know where help is. As if you don't already know, something you'll learn really quickly is that's another thing. Detox and substance inpatient services are not something we have anymore. It's not the way this community moves. And when I say this community, the mental health community, the uh, Department of Mental Health across the the nation, they just don't see things the way as they used to. So 21 day programs are just not fluid and out there like they used to be. We have a couple, we have a co-ed, we have women's and children's. Things that will get people pushed to the top of the list, women pregnant. That person will get in within 24 hours almost every day. So if you can identify a pregnant woman who's using, give us a call, we'll get her some help immediately. She goes to the top of the list over anybody else out there. Yeah. Like really worried about mandated reporting. Are you guys are still like? Is there something we should tell them about that? So no, you know, you and I, you brought that up. I started to go into it, and I don't think I finished it. One thing that we do with our case management services, again, we're community people. We work very, very closely with the mental health court. So if anybody has charges, the first thing our case managers do is they go to the judge and they try to get any of those charges shifted into mental health court. So oftentimes when they have some of these things, especially things like loitering or um, shoplifting, you know, some of your minor offenses, they will happily take those and put them in a mental health court. You have mental health court out here in Independence. We have it in downtown Kansas City. You know, who took over out here because Mr. Commissioner Fry stepped down. But anyway, he was awesome. And but so that's another op opportunity for people to get into services rather than to get into jail. And it's that's exactly what that was created for. Sometimes you might feel some kind of way because you find out like this officer just keeps giving this guy trespassing charges. Well, he's doing that in the hope that this guy will finally say, OK, I'll go to mental health court because mental health court again also is voluntary. They can drop out at any time, but it works the same way as drug court. We work with drug court. So anytime we see an opportunity to help somebody to get around the choices that they've made and make a better tomorrow for themselves, we want to be there and be part of that. So those kinds of things are things that we can help somebody with. So if they're coming and maybe that's why they're right now just 
absolutely in this acute mental breakdown because they think they're going to jail tomorrow. You know, I mean, it could be that. Um, so the mother, that, that that's why we have women and children. It's specifically for that, for the woman who's been on it. They know how to work with the courts. They know the things that the women need to do. They know the places that they can go to get that encouragement and help them out. They know how to help them fill out the information to try to get daycare, you know, so they can get set up to go to school. So that's specifically what that's for. And our hope is always that we keep the children with their families if we can. So if they're pregnant, we've got a great opportunity to make that not happen. So when that baby's born, she's not gonna have to give that baby up. So we will absolutely work with any service you can find out there. If we know they have ser services and they just haven't connected, we'll be that liaison for them to help get them reconnected. Um, I wanna back up real quick because this slide should have been in the... What they can't have, Carrie? <laughs> Because <laughs> she says no more than I do. <laughs> and especially when they're coming from the ERs, the ERs will send us a packet with all the labs and everything. And again, as long as they are not, you know, this close to having, you know, a, a heart attack or a major medical event, we're going to take them. Um, and, and sometimes their BP is going to be over 190. Um, but is it consistent? You know, Anytime anybody's anxious, you know, worked up, you know, first taking, you know, their vital signs, sometimes they're going to be elevated. Uh, but if they, you know, have a history of, um, you know, a recent uh, cardiac event and they're not on any medications and, you know, that medically they're just, you know, this close to being admitted to a medical unit. But our guidelines are um, blood pressure um, systolic over 190, heart rate over 120 or less than 45. Um, their glucose because we get so many clients that are not compliant with any kind of diabetic treatment, um, we, we say lower than 60 or over 250, uh, but sometimes we'll find that you know, clients baseline what they're doing great at is 300 or 350. Um, and you know, when we get them a little bit of insulin and it goes down to you know, 200, then they're really crashing and feeling, feeling crummy. These are the guidelines. Um, if they're actively seizing uh, or have, if they're coming in, um, coming off of alcohol with recent seizures, we're gonna prefer that they go to the emergency room um, and get checked out first. And like Wendy said, um, if ever in doubt, call, because um, you can talk to either the team lead or or the nurse who's on. Um, but it's 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 pretty liberal with um, medically. You know, it takes a lot for us to say no from a medical standpoint. We just want to make sure that they're not going to have a medical event um, while they're there with us. And if they do, if it happens, we call 911 and we send them out and um, get them to the nearest emergency room. And then they return usually. So normally it's something that can be cleared up. So we send them to the hospital, they get cleared up and come back. Sometimes it is they just need a script written because our doctors can't write scripts for medical concerns. So sometimes we just need to send them out for that and come back. And the, the glucose, the reason she talked about that a little bit longer, obviously we have, you know, our friends, we call them, they just come all the time, regulars and visit us. And we see the 400s all the time. Yeah. She's not going to try to take that 400 down because again that person's going to be worse if they're normal because <laughs> they they live at that higher end all the time and if they do have any um equipment uh, any kind of catheter if if you know I, we've had to tell people no you know they can't bring their sleep apps or they can't use them um and it, it's um it's for everybody's safety with the medical school equipment and because we are not a we're not a hospital um mm -hmm. we're we're just um a crisis center so we can't provide um ongoing catheter care IV that wound care not but can have you know they can use crutches or wheelchairs but they have to ambulate we won't we don't do any touching of clients so they have to do all of that on their own so they have to get back and forth and again i told you it's kind of a little chair so if, if they come in and they have a wheelchair can they get themselves into the chair that sort of thing if they can then we're good to go now i will say when you see the part about combative um Sometimes people are just angry because something happened or they're responding in a thing that's not normally them, right? What our combative nature is, are they just going off on every single person? Remember, this is voluntary, so if they don't want to come, 
please don't bring them because they're not going to stay and it's not going to go down very well. But the other thing that I can tell you is we do have some persons in our community that have come. They have struck staff. They have put holes in the walls. They have done our front door. We're not even sure why it's still standing. <laughs> our windows have been busted out so many times. We used to have trash cans outside. We don't do that anymore. Everything comes through the window. So. Um, we have a list of people, and so I would always suggest if you have the opportunity just to call and get somebody on the phone and ask them to run the name, that's helpful because I, I know it happens and I know it's frustrating when you guys get to the front door and they're like, all right, we're going to unload this, and then we're like, oh yeah, we're not taking Joe Schmo because last time, no bueno. So if you can call, there's not a ton of people on that list, and I will say majority of those people are persons that are centralized in downtown Kansas City, so the likelihood that you're going to find them out, in, out here is low, but it can happen. So if you have that moment to make that quick little one-minute phone call and just ask in the name, it's helpful, but it is not mandatory. So any other questions? Yes. We use language line. Um, occasionally, we'll have staff next door that might be able, um, that are fluent because you, you have to be at a certain level. You can't just take something that goes, oh yeah, I can muddle through. That's not good enough. We have to make sure we're giving that person that we're talking to the best ability that we can. So we do have some staff though in our um, our respite care behind us, Thrive, that are bilingual, so we can call on them. But majority of the time, we're using the language line, and we do get we. We get some languages where they have to like call us back because they have to go wake up the specialist sometimes. And so, yeah, but we do always try to make sure that they are understanding what's going on. So language is not a barrier because we will call somebody. And we also use the deaf line as well. So they'll send out an interpreter for us. So for EMS and fire department, basically, because you guys aren't doing the same types of reports on call, like a CIT, when officers come in, they have to give us a CIT report. That's part of their process, right? Basically what happens when the fire department or EMS come in, they check in with the nurse, they give them the information, the medical information at pass off, and the team lead just needs the person's name, social, and birth date. And we understand sometimes you, that that information might be not as correct as we want it to be, but that's all the team lead's going to need, and they're going to go from there. The handoff is you get them out of the ambulance. We're not going to take them out of the ambulance, um, but they can walk right in the front door, and that's about all. Just make sure you've checked in with either the nurse and the team lead, or at minimum, at least one of those two persons. So, say for instance, we do happen to run uh, one of the Let's call like blacklisted people mm -hmm. at your facility, and you know we're not able to call. Mm -hmm. So like the you know, Tom Parker, you know, all like the requirements for admission. We get there, and you see it's this patient who's you have to have kind of ban. What do we do? That's the key part for us. We do not have a banned list. Right. We have a reevaluation. So if you were there, the appropriate and what should happen when you're there. If it doesn't, you can let somebody know is they are to reevaluate that situation. Where is that client at today? Because you're right. Last week, he might have been just blowing everything up and, you know, threatening to blow up all of our cars. And today he's like had an epiphany and he's just like, oh, I'm going to be really calm because I really want help today. We're going to take that person that way. We literally last week had somebody in our facility on Monday that the previous time they had been there, which was three weeks ago, they threatened to harm. They literally got up and touched our director and were chest bumping them and shoving them back into an office and i mean we had to like call the police it was a really bad situation to get this person out of our building but they presented completely different the next time they were at the hospital and when they came to us very cooperative didn't even think it was the same human being you're like you're kidding me and the the, the silly thing is they were still using the same drugs so it wasn't the drugs that had affected them the first time right so that's we don't know so we always will reevaluate but there are some that might have been on they might be on that no we've got to wait the 30 days before we can reallow them so that may happen and if that does if it's somebody where they're just like no we gotta we're on that two week they can't come back in here then we're just going to ask you to take them over to truman 
and they can go to the S pod because that's where they need to be. Freeman's the one you're going to have the least pushback to take somebody to. From us, yeah, you have St. Luke's and all that's going to happen is St. Luke's going to ask you why you didn't take them to KCATC. North Kansas City, they may not let them in. Truman is your best choice. Research second. I know what you guys are saying, but I'm telling you, our 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 communication with them and our commitment with them, that's yeah, and that's our go-to is Truman. We always send people out to Truman. Unless, like if they came from North Kansas City and it was some weird health thing, then you're getting that person back because you we didn't get the correct information. But if something occurs while they're with us, we're sending people over to Truman. Did you get more? We prefer, and I told them that if they can, it's great because it just kind of alleviates some of that. We'll know if that person's on any kind of list or anything that we need to look for. Yeah. yeah. Nine six five eleven hundred. See what I get for using other people's handout. Okay. Yep. No, because this is continuation of care. So you're just doing one service to the next service. It'd be the same as if they were in the emergency room and they have to call in a surgeon. Right, and you're not on the radio. So you're calling over the phone. You tell them, hey, you know what? There's this program. I think we get you connected to services. I think it'll be helpful to you. You're you're sitting here explaining to us that you're in need of this thing. They can help you find that. Um, I mean, just so they know that we are there to serve them. Like, you know, if they don't show up, I have no job to do. So I'm waiting for them to come in. So we can't wait for them to show up so we can figure out what's going on and really sort some of that out. And that's one of the things that a lot of times the the patient we call them clients, you'll call them patients. That's one of the things that's going to be they're hesitant because they're, they don't know about it, they're uncertain, and they sometimes feel like you're just trying to get them into something they're going to be stuck with, right? So just to let them know that it's 100% voluntary, and all we want to do is try to figure out what's really causing their concern and how, how can we step in and help them. I've heard people before, and um, I always found that highlighting that you can leave one of the... Yes. It's like, they know it's totally safe. But... Absolutely. The door is locked because you can't just walk right in and we do have to buzz you out, but we don't stop you. <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. Well, I have passed out the cards and we've left them. Like I said, we are actually redoing these cards. They used to be pocket sized cards. They would fit right in your pocket, right? Because most uniforms have a little pocket somewhere. <laughs> we are having these redone. And as soon as we get these out, I should hopefully have them in the next couple of weeks. I'll make sure you guys get some out here. Um, you can hand these out to other professionals as you see them because we see that a lot. A lot of people don't know about us. A lot of people don't know about all the things that you guys can do. So you're welcome to hand these out to other professionals as you're out there and say, hey, these might be helpful. But I want to make sure you guys have them so you have them with you because it has other numbers on here as well. And as everybody knows, I don't know if you guys are yet training on this, like we have a whole new world opening up in July. So 988 is going to hit and that's really going to kind of change the face of crisis services out there and we really we're, we know it's going to make things better we just not sure how how long it's going to take to kind of smooth things out um, but we're absolutely one of, going to be one of those partners for that opportunity as well awesome all right well thank you guys for letting us come out appreciate it